Fit and Healthy Athlete Podcast. Debbie Potts is here to help you burn fat, optimize health, and enhance your performance in life as you age. We'll explore metabolic health, holistic health, and actionable insights with guest experts and deep dives into health topics. Whether you're an athlete or just looking to thrive, let's discover how to become your best self. Let's get started. It's Debbie, and I'm sitting on the floor stretching at some of you things. So you can do some sit-ups while you're working on the BOSU, some twists. It's good to sit and stand and move while you're working, right? So here we go. I'm going to record and do core work at the same time. Actually, I'm going to do a podcast on how we can improve our metabolism as we age. As I say all the time, don't blame the aging process. Embrace it. Focus on changing how you train so you have muscles and you are rethinking your workout program, your daily routine, your nutrition program. We can't do the same program we did 10, 20 years ago and expect the same results. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting something else to happen, something different. At some point, you realize is not working anymore. I'm not getting anywhere. That's how I was with fasting, fasted exercise. I realized, okay, I'm not losing any weight here. I'm not eating. I'm not really hungry either because I'm pretty fat. I get a burning fat and feeling full and satiated, but I wasn't dropping any weight and I wanted to improve performance in my workouts. So you kind of had to stop, pause, reset, and think, is what I'm doing working for me? If you are confused, overwhelmed on what to do for eating, for your exercise, for your supplements, for your lifestyle routine, your ideal day, week, month, let's test and not guess. Now, that's what I do for my own coaching business is help people that are confused. They're doing all the right things they thought was correct to get results, but it's not quite working because it was for working for somebody else. You are unique. You are you. I am me. What works for me is going to be different for you. There is not one size fits all approach. As Dr. Gappin says, it's one size fail, one size fails all, right? So don't try to do the exact same program someone else is doing and think you're going to look like them if they look amazing. You have different external stressors and we have hidden sources of internal stress we don't know about unless we invest in our health to do the functional lab testing and get someone as myself that's an investigator putting all the pieces of the puzzle together so you can thrive as you age. You can be your best self your second half of your life, kicking ass, doing well in races, the race of life, the journey of life, whatever you want to do. You can Do even better, enjoy life as you age and should be getting better, right? So I want to share my screen if you're watching the YouTube channel. I'm posting this on the audio podcast as well, but ideally you can see some of these slides. If you can find someone to do testing near you for your metabolism, that's something we can't do remote. Everything else I do is remote. But metabolism testing is one thing I suggest doing. It's in person. You've seen, hopefully, my videos, the NOE testing I use. It's a metabolic testing kit that we can test. You can look in their website, Panoe, P-N-O-E. And we can measure all these different markers. Resting metabolism as well as your exercise test. Yes, VO2 max is the strongest independent predictor of health and longevity, but it's not measuring your muscle health. So we want to look at resting metabolism is going to tell us how fast or slow your metabolism is. And we can talk about why metabolism matters and the mitochondria health and the role of mitochondria as we age. So VO2 max is one part of the puzzle. It's not that be an end all because... We, it's measuring your oxygen capacity, your cardiovascular system, not your muscular health, but it does have some 
influence on that because you wouldn't be able to get that that heart rate up, that volume of oxygen up so as high, fitness level as high if you didn't have some muscular endurance, but strength we're not measuring. So chronological age should not be used to accurately predict morbidity and mortality since biological age is a more reliable indicator of lifespan. Again, we hear this all the time, thanks to Peter Atia, that VO2 max is a gold standard method to determine exercise capacity during graded exercise testing and one of the best indicators of biological age. VO2 max is the strongest independent predictor of health and longevity. VO2 max derived biological age allows for better risk stratification management of individuals undertaking exercise testing. I struggle promoting metabolic testing. I've got it a year ago and I still haven't gotten my goal of testing five people a week. It's like one every couple months. I don't know why it's such a challenge. I'm maybe I'm not great at marketing, I guess. It's my passion and purpose to help people be healthy from the inside out, testing and not guessing. And this is one piece of the puzzle of data we can collect to see where you are and look at the biological age versus chronological age. I don't know if people are scared of the word VO2 max and doing a treadmill test to max. I rather think, let's just see where you are. I just did a test last week and someone on a treadmill and we just walked and just walked up a hill and just got to where she started to feel a little uncomfortable. We didn't do a max hurry test. We want to see where she burned the most fat so she can train for endurance events and be in that zone too. But we know as we age, especially for women, we don't need a lot of time in zone two. We're only doing that because she's training for endurance event that you need to be fat adapted, big aerobic engine for that zone to be able to stay there. But if you're not training for any endurance events, I wouldn't focus so much on zone two, maybe one day a week. We can identify that in her test, but we want to improve metabolism and speed, power, strength. So the VO2 max is one part of it. And so you can read about it on Pinoy. I'll put this link in the show notes about VO2 max and looking at biological age markers. So there's different genetic factors, shortened telomere length, uh, looking at results of different tests that I talked to, true age diagnostics, DNA methylation, your epigenetic clock work, it gets a little confusing area, but those are different ways to t- establish your biomarkers for biological age. Now, VO2 max, we keep hearing about, that's what we do with the exercise test. VO2 max typically decreases by about 7% for women, 10% men per decade from around age 25. That's crazy. And there's a direct related to the rate of this decline. For each one milliliter per minute kilogram of decreased VO2 max, the risk increases by 14%, suggesting that the need to maintain, but also with the need to improve your cardiovascular fitness. Again, it's one part of the equation. Now, genetic factors determine about 50% of your VO2 max. Regular endurance training can improve it in eight to 52 weeks. That's a huge <laughs> range by 13 to 20% or around 0.5 liters a minute, depending on your exercise intensity. So we can test that and figure out your biological age from a VO2 max, as it's a more accurate risk stratification, Pinoy says, in those individuals undergoing exercise testing as a 70-year-old man, person that's trained, can have the same biological age as someone untrained 50-year-old, based on their VO2 max. In a recent study, they say in this article, VO2 max associated biological age demonstrated better discrimination for mortality and MI than chronological age. So biological age may help identify those who would benefit from pharmacological and more aggressive lifestyle interventions. I don't know about pharmacological. Utilizing biological age provides intuitive understanding of fitness mediated risk and may prompt for blah, blah, blah lifestyle changes. So you can look at that and the research on VO2. Again, it's not just for athletes, it's for longevity. So I have three different buckets, which all should overlap. Fat loss, 
performance, athletic performance or performance in life. I'm again, training for life. I'm not training for any race specifically. It's the race of life and longevity. So they all should kind of go hand in hand, but this is a good information on the importance of VO2 max and longevity. And then I want to go over an article I was just putting together on some research, looking at biological age cells, five-year reduction biological age. VO2 max is 3.5 milliliters a minute per kilogram, increases the VO2 max we want to see. Lung fitness, cognitive fat burn, mobility, heart fitness, breathing mechanics, metabolism, all these factors that influence your biological age. Now, as I said in the beginning, we want to stop blaming the aging process and start embracing it. Don't, please don't use, I'm getting older. It's just what happens. That's my new normal. It's an excuse. It's an excuse for not taking ownership of your health and taking a different approach to the exercise and nutrition lifestyle habits we need to do to thrive as we age. Yes, we do get older. Yes, I do have wrinkles under my eyes that I cannot stand and I feel so much younger, but the wrinkles under my eyes are my area of opportunity that I'm doing everything I can. <laughs> but the rest of it, I am also trying to change how I train and not do chronic cardio to lose weight. To get my body composition changed is my goal, not do more cardio to lose weight. I know to lose five, 10 pounds I want to lose. It's adjusting my focus and my mindset on different factors. So let's go into what happens. First of all, why and how does the metabolism slow down as we age? All right. As I say these, I want you to think about how many of these items that are on this list. There are nine things that were came up when I put this together. Nine factors, primary reasons metabolism slows down with age. I want you to think about which one of these is something that we cannot control and do something about. Number one, loss of muscle mass. Sarcopenia is loss of muscle mass as we age. Muscle mass naturally declines with age due to the process of sarcopenia. Muscle is metabolically active tissue that burns more calories at rest than fat. Losing muscle decreases your resting metabolic rate. All right. I think if we know the answer. Age-related reductions in physical activity. Hmm. Hello. Can accelerate muscle loss, further slowing metabolism. Well, okay. Think about that. Number two, hormonal changes. For women, a drop in estrogen levels during menopause. Remember, perimenopause can start in your 40s. Menopause is only one day when you haven't had your period for 12 months. And then the next day, you're in postmenopause. So just to clarify that if you haven't heard that. Now, that drop in estrogen can lead to decrease in muscle mass and increase in fat storage, especially in the abdominal area. In men, declining testosterone levels reduce muscle mass and strength. What can you do about it? Hmm. Growth hormone and IGF-1. Levels of these hormones are both crucial for maintaining muscle mass, decline with age, contribute to slower metabolism. How can you increase your growth hormone? Mitochondria function. As we age, the efficiency and number of mitochondria, the energy producing units of our cells decrease, leading to lower metabolic rate and reduced energy production. Oxidative stress, aging increases oxidative stress and mitochondrial damage contributing to less efficient energy utilization. All right, think about that. Oh, here's a, a challenging one. We have reduced physical activity. Older adults become less physically active due to factors as joint pain. Oh, joints, injuries, lifestyle changes, laziness, 
sedentary. I don't think that is uh, by choice. What do you think? I think, yes, it is. It's a choice. Reduced activity leads to less energy expenditure. They're not moving around. They're sitting more. Contributes to a slower metabolism. Neat, which is what I'm doing. I'm moving around. Daily movements is walking, fidgeting, household chores tend to decrease with age and lower overall calorie burn. N-E-A-T, NEAT, non-exercise activity thermogenesis, something I'm working on adding in during the day. Number five, decrease nutritional needs and appetite. As we age, appetite and overall calorie intake tends to decrease, which can reduction cause a reduction in muscle mass if protein needs are not adequately met, slowing metabolism further. What would the solution be? Eat protein. Age-related declines in digestive efficiency can affect the absorption of nutrients like protein impacting muscle preservation. Hmm. Number six, thyroid function changes. Thyroid gland produces hormones that regulate metabolism. As we age, thyroid function can slow down, leading to reduced production of these hormones and a slower metabolism. Hmm, thyroid health. T4 needs to convert to T3. Conversion issues are factor, liver congestion, and gut dysbiosis, by the way, is going to impact your conversion of T4 to active T3, as well as not having the ingredients as iodine, selenium, and tyrosine. So you need your iodine, you need to eat healthy fats or hormones, and we need to have tyrosine coming from amino acids coming from meat. All right. Number seven, increased fat accumulation with age is increase in body fat percentage, visceral fat while lean muscle decreases. What are you going to do about it, people? Since fat tissue has lower metab- metabolic rate than muscle, these shifts slow down metabolism. Solution would be fill in the blank. Number eight, decrease protein synthesis, anabolic resistance. Anabolic means break down, I mean build up, and catabolic means break down. As we age, our muscle becomes less responsive to protein intake and exercise, leading to reduced muscle protein synthesis. This anabolic resistance requires, listen, especially you ladies, Higher protein intake specific to strength training in to maintain muscle mass and metabolic rate. Stacey Sims even said that post-workout window to get 20, 30 grams is not enough. Older females, we need 40, 50 grams of protein because we're more anabolic resistance with that lower estrogen. Read that again. As we age, our muscles become less responsive to protein intake and exercise, leading to reduced muscle protein synthesis. Solution would be eat even more than the minimum of protein. Lift heavier weights to stimulate that muscle protein synthesis. Time your nutrition to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. Synthesis. All right, last one. Alterations in sleep patterns. Aging can disrupt sleep quality and duration. I add hormones negatively impact metabolism, hormone regulation as insulin and cortisol. How do you manage insulin and your cortisol? Stress management and nutrition. Remember, you become insulin resistant from excess cortisol being stressed chronically. I had that happen to me. Remember, I gained 30 pounds even though I just was off my best athletic career race-wise and I was eating low carb too low carb and not enough calories and not enough protein back then 10 years ago but I was doing the fasted and bulletproof coffee and having barely much to eat because I was good at burning fat but I wasn't eating enough calories so 
there became hormone disruption. Conclusion, muscle loss, hormone changes, reduced mitochondrial function, decreased physical activity, and shifts in the body composition all contribute to slower metabolism as we age. However, engaging in regular resistance training, maintaining a high protein diet, staying active, addressing sleep, stress management, hormone health can mitigate these changes and preserve muscle health. So if your metabolism is slower, go back and read this on my blog page, tips to speed up your metabolism as you age. None of this is something that you can't do something about. All of these nine things you can do something about. Take ownership of your health and start creating your ideal self in the future today. Now, how would this get all off? I hate when you write a blog and then you save it and then gets the font gets all wacky. Strength training. Build your muscle mass through resistance training. Men and women, a little different. Building muscle mass improves that RMR. Muscle tissue burns more calories at rest than fat tissue. High intensity interval training can elevate metabolic rate post workout. That EPOC can help fat loss more effectively than moderate intensity state. But you don't do hit or sit training every day. Women, we have a lot of stressors during our hormone changes. Stacey Sims suggests the sprint interval training, not the hit training, because it's less stress during intervals under 45 seconds. So all these people doing the four by four workouts for VO2 max which usually is done wrong. It's supposed to be zone four for four minutes, zone one for four minutes. But sprint interval training, you can do those 10 to 30 second sprints and not cause excessive source of stress if you're under a lot of chronic stress already. Now, zone two or zone one, you can add in during the week, but add in movement. Remember, exercise and movement are two different things. When we go to the gym, work out. I went for a bike ride, did my hill workout today on the bike, but I still need the other part of the holistic method is movement, getting steps throughout the day. So if you're working out in the morning and then you're sitting on your behind all day long, you're forgetting the other part of health is movement throughout the day, NEAT, N-E-A-T, and mobility. Yoga restorative exercise. All right, balanced diets, rich in protein to boost metabolism. And I just did a podcast on that last week on muscle protein synthesis. The role of protein and amino acids. We have 20 different amino acids. Nine are classified as essential amino acids. These are important for muscle protein synthesis. Among the essential amino acids, leucine, plays a crucial role in stimulating this MPS. Leucine acts as the key activator of mTOR pathway. This is a primary signaling pathway to trigger MPS. When you consume protein, quality protein has to have this essential amino acid profile, especially rich in leucine, about two to three grams per meal to signal muscles start synthesizing proteins. You can throw your meal together, get, say, I saw someone post their 40, 50 grams of protein in a meal, but it had some rice in it and some vegetables and fish. The fish would have probably the right amount of essential amino acids and with the leucine, but I would calculate online how much did that rice have with the protein in it and leucine. Total of that meal how much were your essential amino acids with how much leucine? That's where it gets complicated when you're counting protein from plant-based grains and animal-based meat, right? Or seafood. So you need to, yes, that's 50 grams of protein. But as we've talked a lot about, not all protein is equal. Really important part because you got to get the right ingredients, those building blocks all together to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. Key concepts, high quality protein, 
nine essential amino acids rich in leucine. Animal-based as whey, chicken, beef, eggs, fish generally have higher leucine content compared to plant-based proteins. To effectively stimulate MPS, each meal should reach the leucine threshold. If your protein intake falls short of this, MPS will not fully be activated, potentially leading to suboptimal muscle growth repair and maintenance. Distributing your protein intake across multiple meals with each meal providing sufficient leucine and essential amino acids is more effective than consuming all your protein in one or two larger meals. For years, we were doing OMAD, right? Were you one of those? I was doing, you know, still kind of do two meals, but I have to do add in a, a whey protein essential amino acids to hit my protein goal. But I was doing OMAD for a while. It doesn't work when you're training as much as we do. I was running my fitness studio and working out two, three times a day or more and moving all day that I caused my thyroid so low, my T3 super low. And I, I think a lot of it is coming from that, doing too much fasting, not eating enough calories. Now, protein distribution, MPS, high quality protein sources, muscle maintenance and aging. This is a lot of information you can listen to Dr. Gabrielle Lyon and Donald Lehman's research and Lane Norton. As you age, body experiences anabolic resistance. We talked about that and Stacey Sims said this too. And I added this meaning it requires more protein and leucine to stimulate muscle protein effectively. This is why it's such a big area of focus. I'm going to expand this on the screen. You have to eat enough protein. Older adults might need 40 to 60 grams of higher protein per meal to reach the leucine threshold and counteract muscle loss. Per meal, those of you eating one egg on a piece of toast or something or avocado with an egg, that's six grams of protein. That might fill you up, but if you are focused on speeding up your metabolism, you must figure out a meal plan that is stimulating muscle protein synthesis and change how you are training. If you're complaining of your body composition getting fatter and you're losing muscle, you have to rethink what you're doing. It, what you used to do is not going to probably work for you, men and women. Now, if you're exercising, that pre-post workout, you'll hear about the 40, 50 grams of protein with enough leucine. Post workout, there's a big debate if it has to be 30 minutes or three hours, or it doesn't matter within the day. But I think I'm going with the female needs to have it afterwards. So, meal planning, you can give people ideas on, a, I can use Rupa Health, that little AI food chart with my clients to figure out here's what I like to eat. Here's my meals, my snacks, What, how many I want per day. What's my goal protein we can calculate? And it will spit out a little meal plan for the week. Now, if you're doing plant-based, you have to really be creative. Because as I said before, I've done all the calculations trying to hit that 40, 50 grams of protein with leucine. And you end up getting way too many calories. So if you are plant-based, vegan, vegetarian, I would make sure you take a methylated B complex, getting uh, like Myers cocktail IV sometimes. You know, a lot of people can benefit from that when you're stressing your body out. But you are going to get probably too many calories in and not hitting that protein goal. So I would do essential amino acids from Body Health that you can get from my full script account at a discount, 20% off for my clients. And... If you can do the whey protein, I've been trying to do that with my creatine, with water. So it's not any calories, but getting some that protein. Well, it has calories in the whey protein, but I just mean creatine. It's not a big, huge meal. So prioritizing protein with all essential amino acids and hitting that leucine goal is vital for optimizing muscle protein synthesis. Support muscle growth, recovery, repair, maintenance, especially for athletes, especially for those who want to improve the aging process to preserve the muscle as you age. So we're fighting uphill battle and we need to do things differently. So hydration, sleep quality, stress management, all that makes a difference. Can you do some metabolism testing? We want to see where you are 
metabolic efficiency, set your heart rate training zones, figure out where you burn the most fat, how you're going to do your sprints. What is your zone one that you need to be in for recovery? Now, can you get your blood work, hormone imbalance, looking at thyroid, cortisol, sex hormones, all impact your metabolism. Nutrient deficiencies, identifying vitamins and minerals that you're low in, insulin sensitivity, looking at blood glucose, insulin, A1C, that all is important for healthy metabolism. And then your inflammation markers, chronic inflammation affects metabolism, fat storage, blood tests can identify markers of inflammation and help us figure out a protocol for you. So getting Pinoy metabolic testing, get your blood chemistry. If we can do more of my health investigation packages, I have clients do a food sensitivity test, that hormone test, or you can do the saliva test. And for sure, everyone could benefit from a, a gut stool test. So it depends on your budget, but for sure, I would do a stool microbiome test and blood chemistry assessment. Try to always go to your insurance first with your doctor, but don't get them to test things that are not covered by insurance, but they'll... Ch- charge you thousand dollars is ridiculous we want to go to get your labs direct you can go to ulta labs or group of health i can send people a link to get their blood chemistry test and get apob and lp little a and insulin and crp vitamin d and all these things that the doctor is not testing t3 t4 so you want to look at glucose insulin i put all the Optimal, you don't want to be normal. Remember, normal lab markers, everyone's doctor will say, oh, you're fine. Nothing, everything's in range. Well, that range is based on sick people. Do not use your normal ranges on your lab lab markers, your lab reports. They don't work. You want to be optimal. So we want to figure out what that means. And then look at if you're higher, lower than the optimal range, what is that a clue towards? Because we can get a lot of clues from your blood chemistry panel of, Male digestion, male absorption, infection, parasite, H. pylori. There's a lot of things we can find out. Now, total cholesterol, LDL, HDL, triglycerides. Out of those basic lipid panel, I really think triglycerides and LDL, LP little a, APOB is what people are talking about more so now. CRP, you want to make sure that's like 0.5. Vitamin D, you want even 60 to 80 not 20 to 30 that most labs say. Thyroid hormone, we want to look at free T3, upper range, 3.2 to 4.2 suggested, 1.1 to 1.8 on free T4, and your reverse T3, you got to ask, and your thyroid antibodies, you for sure want to get done, TPO and TG. Now, my thyroid free T3 has been 2.0, but the doctor says I'm normal. So I need to go find a specialist so I can get T3 medication or figure out why is my thyroid low? Because I've been taking T3 before just for a month, didn't do anything. And I know a lot of people will be on thyroid medication and it doesn't help them at all. It doesn't change your T3 because you need to look at the root cause, what is causing it. A lot of times it's stress. So we need to look at your adrenal HPA axis, your cortisol levels, look at your liver congestion and look at those ALT, AST and GGT markers that are going to be important for your liver health detoxification, which is essential for your metabolic health and role of your mitochondria. So we really want to look at these. Ferritin, a lot of people are low in iron that I test. Your acid High uric acid associated with metabolic dysfunction, poor mitochondria health, looking at fructose in your diet. CoQ10, lactate pyruvate, and I put this whole article on how lactate shuttling, but elevated levels can indicate poor mitochondria function and reliance on anaerobic metabolism if your lactate to pyruvate levels high. We now know that lactate acid is not bad. Is lactate is sh- lactate shuttling is a big thing. So you can read all about that. I've talked about that a little bit, and about lactate shuttling that allows your body to recycle lactate to a usable energy enhancing performance, and endurance, and also brain health. Understanding this process, there's a super in depth podcast Peter Atia has with a doctor on lactate. If you want to geek out. So you want to rethink how you train as you age. So again, type of exercise, less chronic cardio machines. All the people that I've said this for years and doctor, so we've talked about this few doctors and then JJ Virgin and I were talking about this yesterday on our show. We recorded, you look at the gym, 
Look at the people in the cardio machines and look at people lifting weights. Look at their body shape. I've said this forever since I worked out and trained at the clients at the Bellevue Club in Bellevue, Washington. There's a difference, shape of their body. They don't look any different in the cardio machine. They're there, they're consistent, but get a trainer to help you. I'm so tired of seeing people being so good at coming to the gym, consistent, but they're really not doing everything that they could be doing right. So resistance training, plyometrics, power training, hit training, sprint interval training are really important to look at. Frequency of training, how often you should do it, you know, aging athletes, peri postmenopausal women, two to four days a week. Sufficient volume to stimulate MPS and make sure you have recovery in between. We need more recovery and as you age, but also genetically, you can look at your reports. I need more recovery. Aerobic exercise hit training. So zone two and some hit, maybe you add in hit at the end of your workout as I do sometimes. Then intensity level, resistance, power, and hit training can look at that. And then I looked up duration and then specific considerations for peri postmenopause. Because we have these hormonal changes in muscle health as we have a decline in estrogen, reduction in muscle mass, bone density, recovery capacity, strength training, and protein intake must be optimized to counteract these effects. Exercise to support bone health, resistance training. Weight bearing impact, weighted lunges, squats, step ups with weights, maintaining bone density, not swimming in the pool. That's good for you, but it doesn't strengthen the bones. Really important. I tell my swimming friends, you got to do some dry land training with some weights. Now, due to anabolic resistance, we talked about peri postmenopause women need to increase intake even more than men, probably, I would say, with that leucine, two to three grams a meal with all the essential amino acids to stimulate. So summary, prioritize your resistance training, figure out how to add power training, complement with that zone two training once a week and some hit training. Or for women, we need more sprint interval training, 10, 30 seconds. Aim for two to four resistance sessions a week, one, two power plyo, two to three aerobic or hit. And this is where it's going to differ. And men, you guys are supposed to need more zone two than females, but ideally you do a metabolic test with me and then we can identify what you need to do. So figuring out resistance, training, cardio, hip, power, all that together. More resistance links on resistance training, sorry, and aging and protein intake. You can look all that up. 2006, long time ago. So I'm sure there's updated studies. That's just what showed up. If you want to know more about what I do, how I can work with you or corporate fitness accounts or group training, head to debbiepotts.net and let me know your thoughts. All right. Have a great day. Thanks for listening and share this episode. If you liked what you heard and could help some other people pay it forward. Thanks for listening to the Fit and Healthy Athlete Podcast. Coach Debbie Potts draws from decades of experience. Ready to optimize your health? Visit www.debbiepotts.net for a discovery call. Find her on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook at Coach Debbie Potts. To support the show, like, rate, and review. See you next time.